Hi, we're going to go through the last method for this week. This is another all pair shortest path algorithm and it is called the Floyd Warshall algorithm. It is going to be very similar to the matrix multiplication method from the last lecture, but it is going to have a different decomposition. And in fact, I often think that we're going to we're going through matrix multiplication method just so that you can understand Floyd Warshall better because it is the more popular one. So if you remember with matrix multiplication, we find the shortest path from i to j with just one edge and then with two edges and then with three edges and so on. Now with Follett Warshall, we're gonna be doing something different, but it's still very, very similar. In fact, the recursion tree is pretty much the same thing with just one tiny change. Well, what is this slight change? Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about in this lecture, but first, uh, let's just know that everything else will be the same. We still have a directed graph. We allow negative weights. It's just that we can't have negative weight cycles, right? All right, so let's get started with the main idea. Sorry, I have a slight mistake here. That should be 5, 6 instead of 6, 8. Um, so to make the explanation for this algorithm easier, I'm just going to call the vertices one, two, three, all the way up to n. So if you have n vertices, they are going to be numbered consecutively, right? You won't be skipping any numbers here. Uh, and then I'm going to take a subset, one, two, three, up to k, where k is less than n. And then I'm going to define pijk to be the shortest path from i to j with intermediate vertices only in the set one, two, dot, 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 up to k. Now, this is going to be different to matrix multiplication. This is the, this is the, actually the main difference. Um, in matrix multiplication, you have m up here, right? Um, and m tells you that that's the most number of edges you can have in the shortest path. So pijm, that's the shortest path using up to m edges. Here, pijk is the shortest path from i to j using vertices only uh, inside the set one two, three, dot, 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 k. All right, let's, let's, let's use an example to make this clear. Let's say i is equal to five, j is equal to six, and you can see here that the shortest path is going to be three, right? But that is the shortest path overall. If I look at the shortest path, where only vertices in one, two, three is allowed in the path, then it means I can't use four. If you're allowed to use uh, those, um, if you're allowed to only use the uh, vertices one, two, and three, then the shorter path is actually five to one, one to three, three to two, two to six. Again, because you're not allowed to go through four, and the weight is actually eighteen, seven plus two plus two plus seven. Okay, so that is the main definition that you need to understand this algorithm. Is that the only path going from five to six using vertices in um, phi star, like one, two, three? No, because you can also go five, one, uh, two, six, and that'll cost you seven plus 11 plus seven, that'll, so that'll cost you 25. You can also go five, one, three, six directly, and that will cost you 21. So again, if you're only allowed to use vertices one, two, and three, in the path, then uh, five one three two, and sorry five one three two six, with weight eighteen, is the best that you can do. So this time you don't care about the number of edges; you care about what vertices are in the path. So with maximum operation, you look at path with just one edge, and then two edges, and then three edges, and so on. With flight washer. You look at the path that only contains one as an intermediate vertex. Now, if you look at that graph there, can you go from five to six when, if you only have one in the inter, uh, in the path? You can't. So that's going to be infinity, right? So you look at all the path containing only one, and then you look at all the path containing one and two, and then path with one, two, and three, and then so on, one, two, three, four, until eventually you get to one, two, three, four, five, six. That means you you have used up all the vertices, um, or at least you're saying that um, I look, you look at all the path that goes through every single vertex in the graph, and you're done. Okay, so that's the basic idea of Floyd Warshall algorithm. This is still a dynamic programming 
um, algorithm. So you are still doing brute force. It's just a different way of brute forcing compared to matrix multiplication. Okay, so one more time, just to make sure that you understand the notation. Uh, P561, as I said, you can't do it because there's no way you can get to five to six. Sorry, you can't, there's no way you can get from five to six if you can only go through vertex one. Uh, P256, uh, sorry, P562. Uh, doesn't matter how you want to read this. Um, can you go to six if you're only allowed to use 36, one and two? Yeah, you can, but this is the path now. That's the best you can do. It's, it's gonna cost you 25. If you're allowed to go to three as well, then this is the path, the one that we had before, the weight is 18. If you're allowed to go to four as well, that's when you actually get the shortest path because you just go five, four, six. Okay. Now, this lecture really builds up on the previous lecture. Like I said, I often think that doing matrix multiplication is just a ploy to make it easy for you to understand floyd warshall algorithm. And at this point, it would be really good if you understand how the decomposition work in matrix multiplication, because that's what we're going to be doing next with floyd warshall We're going to decompose the problem. So if you want to go back to matrix multiplication, make sure you understand it, go for it. Just stop here and come back later when you're ready. Right. But anyway, if you're okay, let's move forward. How do we decompose the, the, the problem into subproblems? So mainly, how does PIJK relates to PIJK minus one? I'm just gonna say PK and PK minus one. Okay, so PK minus one, you have paths where the vertices inside the path are just from one up to K minus one. And then PK, you will take the next vertex, you will take the vertex K and see if that will make any difference. All right, so when you're adding this K to the set, you have two possibilities. One, the easy one. Like adding K doesn't make any difference. So your PK would be the same with PK minus one. Um, I'll show you an example of this later, but let's talk about the second possibility. And in that when you add the vertex K, you're going to use it. It's going to make a difference. It's going to give you a shorter path. Cool. That means I can now decompose P K into two parts. That is the shortest path from I to K. And the vertices in this path is going to be from one to dot dot up to K minus one. And also the shortest path from k to j, again with the vertices in one, two, dot, dot, k minus one. Guess what? That is the definition of pk minus one, right? So anyway, let's look at some examples to make it more clear. Okay, case number one. So you pick the next k and you put inside the set and it doesn't make any difference. So here's an example. Um, let's look at p five, six, two. So um, the shortest path from five to six, if you're allowed to have one and two only in the, in the, uh, in the path. So you can go five, one, two, six, that will cost you, um, well, I changed the weights on this one. Uh, so the cost is gonna be six. Now, you're going to go to the next uh, iteration. You're going to increase K now. You're gonna say K equal to three. Um, is it going to make a difference in the path if you use three? Well, if I go to three, I'm gonna go like five, one, three, and then no matter where I go, it's gonna cost me 12. So the cheapest I can get is actually, um, well, if I go to three, it will cost me um, 16. Well, you already know how to get there with six. You already know how to get from five to six with just six, right, with this green um, path here. So why take it? Okay, so P563 is still gonna be six. That's the weight of the shortest path, okay? So that's case one where you pick the next K and it doesn't make any difference. Now, the second case. So I changed the weights again here to make it easier to see the example. So P2, sorry, P562, uh, the shortest path, if you can only go through one and two, is going to be two plus 12 plus two is going to be 16. So if you include three in the shortest path, you are going to make a difference. It's going to be cheaper because as you can see from the graph, 
This is 2, 2, 2, 2. That's going to cost you 8. Now, the question is, how does computer know that? I mean, you can see it from the graph. You can see the lines. You can work it out. But how does the algorithm work? Can you see the, um, can you see the relation between the problem and the subproblems? Right? That's what we're going to be doing now. How do I know that this path one sorry five one three two six is cheaper than going five one two six? Well, if I have the path five one three two six, I can decompose that into the path five to three and then three to six. And if I already computed P I J two for all pairs of I J, then I can simply look at the uh, something that I have computed before. I can I just I can just spark out P five three and P36 from that uh, matrix. So we have to do something similar to what we did in the matrix multiplication method. That is, we're going to compute a matrix that will record all the shortest path using only vertices from 1 up to k, i.e. we're going to be uh, computing a matrix that contains dijk, as I define it here. So dijk is like the equivalent for L uh, in the matrix multiplication method. Uh, basically, that is the weight of the shortest path from vertex i to j if all the intermediate vertices are in a set 1 up to k. So, again, just to get you used to the notation, um, you can think about what the ij0 is. Well, it's going to be the weight of the shortest path from i to j with no intermediate vertices. So, our vertices start at 1, right? So 0 means no vertices, uh, is less than 1. So that means that dij0 is just the weight of the edge i to j, if there is one. Does this feel similar to the uh, matrix multiplication method, by the way? Because when you think about it, the first matrix that you have, the, um, the one with 0 is just the adjacency matrix. Great, so we know the starting point. So now, how do we compute the matrix in general? Um, how do you go from k-1 to k? Or the other way to think about it, how do you decompose k uh, in general? Well, we saw the example earlier where I split the path from 5 to 6. So P563, I'll split that into two paths, um, P532 and P362. Basically, we decompose the path into two paths that do not have three in it. So that's your decomposition. So if you want to find pijk, then you're going to look at pijk minus 1. Well, equivalently, if you want to find dijk, you look at dijk minus 1. Um, there are two possibilities. One, k is not going to do anything. As in, um, you will have the shortest path without k anyway. So that's the first case here. And number two, um, k is in the shortest path. So if that's the case, well, the, the sum of the shortest path without k is going to be the shortest path from i to j now. Whereas this one here, with the first case, when k doesn't do anything, you just have the same shortest path as before, no change. Okay, so really that's it. We're going to compute a series of matrices, dij, containing dij, um, yeah, sorry, um, just as before, I got the matrix L and big L. Now you got small d and big D, uh, but you know what I mean, like the matrix is called big D, I guess, uh, and contains all the small d's. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I hope that's all right. Anyway, that is the um, recursive relationship. Um, I guess one more difference with the matrix multiplication method is that you don't need the adjacency matrix to work out the next uh, matrix. So if you want to work out dk, uh, sorry, dijk, all you need is dijk minus 1. So um, you'll see how this works with example. It's always good to go through an example. So let's go through that now. I'm going to start with d1 here. Now, just a note here. You should probably start from d0 because d0 is the adjacency matrix. Remember, like d0 means you're not using any intermediate vertices. Whereas D1, you're actually using 1 as an intermediate vertex. But as you can see here, nothing can go to 1 anyway. So D0 and D1 is going to look exactly the same, which is why I'm starting from D1. But just be aware, 
um, if this was a question, you might need to go from D0 because D1 will be different to D0. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're in D1 now. We have D1 and we're going to make D2. So that is the shortest path if you're allowed to go to 2 as well. Um, so how do we do this? All right. Um, first, the main diagonal is not going to get changed because that's just um, I going to I, like zero, um, 1 going to 1, 2 going to 2, 3 going to 2. So distance will always be 0. Um, let's think about D2. Let's think about this cell here. Let's think about um, this cell, the second column in the first row. All right. Can we go from 1 to 2, fire 2? That's, that's what it's saying there. What we have now, 8, is the shortest path of going from 1 to 2 if you're only allowed to have 1 as an intermediate vertex. Well, 1 is connected to 2 anyway. There's an edge directly from 1 to 2. So I can get 8 without any intermediate vertex. And allowing the use of 2, when we compute D2, right, it's not going to do anything anyway. Because again, it's just 1, 2, 1, 2. Um, that doesn't make any difference. So 8 will remain as 8. Okay. Um, what about the next column? What about column 3? Now, this is going to be the shortest path going from 1 to 3 because it's in um, row 1, column 3. So the shortest path going from 1 to 3 if you're allowed to use 2 as an intermediate vertex. Now, can 2 go to 3 anyway? No. Can 1 go to 3? No. So it's not going to make any difference. So you can 1 go to 3, well, that is infinity here, and can 2 go to 3? No, it's also infinity, so this one here, uh, it's not going to do anything. So for the next one, column 4, can we go from 1 to 4 via 2? And now you see that, yeah, you can. You can go to 4 from 2, it costs you 9. Now, what we have now is, can we go from 1 to 4 right now? Yeah, it costs you infinity, right? Because, well, there's no path from 1 to 4 at the moment. Now, it costs you 8 to get to 2. You can see it here. That's your shortest path so far. And it costs you 9 to get from 2 to 4. So now it will cost you 17 to go from 1 to 4 via 2. See, this is how you update the, the matrix. Last one. Um, can we go from 1 to 5 via 2? Yes, we can. It's going to cost you 3. And, well, what is the cost of going from 1 to 2? It costs you 8 from going from 1 to 2, right? So, um, if you want to go from 1 to 5 via 2, it'll cost you 8 plus 3. It's going to cost you 11. But, right now, we know it only costs you minus 4 to get to 5. So, is this going to make a difference? No, we're going to, dis um, we're going to discard that. Okay. So the only update we need to do on this row is to put 17 here instead of infinity. So that is your D2. Well, we only discussed how to compute the first row so far, but I went ahead and updated the third row anyway. This is, I'm pretty sure this is uh, D2. Um, because uh, where else can 2 go to? 2 can only go to 5. Um, so... What can you improve? You can improve 3 going to 5, I guess. So that's 3 going to 5. So as you can see here, there's a 10 there. Oh, sorry. Uh, 2 cancel could do 4. So if you imagine it right now uh, in D1, 3, 4 is infinity because you can't get there. And 3, 5 is also infinity because you can't, you, can't, you can't get to from, sorry, you can't get from 3 to 5 using 1, right? But if you allow the use of 2 as an intermediate vertex, well, you can go 3 to 5 and 3 to 4. So 3 to 4 is going to cost you 16, and 3 to 5 is going to cost you 10. So that's why there's two changes here. All right, so that's what happens. Um, we'll do this again in the workshop, because I think that's a better place to discuss the running of the algorithm anyway. So let's say we have D2 now, and we're going to compute D3. Um, I'm going to be a bit more formal here. I'll put down the recursive relationship. And I guess I'll highlight um, D12. So we, we're going to find again the shortest path from 1 to 2. But this time, if you allow to have uh, 3 in it as well. So what I have to do is I have to compare the cost of going from 
one to two without using three. So that's um, um, this eight here. And compare that to the cost of going from one to two if I go through three. And I can find that information. I, I can know what it is by looking at D13 and D32. So D13 is infinity. I can't get to three anyway. So does it matter if I can get to two from three? Nope, it will still cost you infinity. So um, that's, oh, sorry, that's not gonna cost you infinity, sorry. Uh, it's gonna cost you eight because you can get them from eight. So you're comparing eight and infinity. So the answer with that one is going to be 8. So you will not change D12. What about D13? Again, uh, you're going to be comparing uh, the cost of going from 1 to 3 using only 2 as an intermediate vertex. So that would be, well, sorry, it's going to cover up here. It's going to be infinity. Then you look at the cost of going from um, 1 to 3 and then going from 3 to 3. Well, it's going to be 0. It's still going to be infinity. Nothing's just gonna change. Next one. We're going to look at the cost of going from one to four, if you allow three to be in it. Well, actually, this one, one four and one five, they both will not make any difference. Why? Because one can't get to three. So, right, so you're looking at all the path from one to like, to two, to three, to four, to five, well, if you're going to be looking at the path um, from three, so you have to go to if you have, you have to go via three. Well, I can't get to three anyway, so you're not going to change anything on the first row, right? You're also not going to change anything on the second row because two can't get to three. Well, as in, well, it can get to three eventually if you include four and five, but right now you're only allowed to have up to uh, two, so there's no way you can get to three. So row one, row two is going to say the same. So I guess the interesting thing happens when you start to compute the fourth row. Well, row three, again, is not going to change because, well, you're gonna to go to three anyway, right? So um, there will be no difference. Um, now row four is when we actually gonna see something. Let's look at the first case. Um, can I go from 4 to 1 if you're only allowed to go through 1 and 2? Well, the answer is here. I can't. It's infinity. Okay. So now what if I go from 4 to 1 via 3? So I go 4, 3, and then 3, 1. Well, bad news is going from 3 to 1 so far is also infinity. So um, it doesn't matter if you can go from 4 to 3 minus 5. You still get infinity and infinity, so you can't get from four to one. And you can you can uh, you can um, make sure that the only way you can get from four to one is you go through five as well. Actually, no. I'm, what am I talking about? You can't get to one regardless. So that would be infinity anyway. I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry, I'm I got confused with the arrows. Uh, let's let's look at now the uh, second line. Can I go from four to two using only vertices one and two as the intermediate vertices. Uh, let's look at here, like four, two, no, I can't, it's infinity. All right, now, can I go from four to three and then from three to two using, you know, the only two as an infinite vertices? And yeah, I can, I can go from four to three. So four, three, it costs you minus five. Three, two, it costs you seven. Oh, sorry, we're up there now. Three, two, uh, it costs you seven. So the cost of going from four to two, if you're allowed to use three as an intermediate vertex, is going to be two. So you can, um, this infinity here, you can now change that into a two in D3. On the next one, um, can I go from four to three? Well, the answer is going to be... Um, four so it should be four there three yeah you can it costs you minus five and can i get the four three and then three three well it's just going to be minus five and zero so that's going to make no difference finally the last line we're going to skip four four right because that's just going to be zero 
Um, so D4, 5, can I get from 4 to 5 if I can only go through 1 and 2? The answer is no, that's why it's infinity here. But can I go from 4 to 3 uh, via 2? Yes, I can. So that's uh, minus 5. Can I go from 3 to 5 via 2? Yes, I can. The answer is 10. These the deadline there. So now I can improve my path going from 4 to 5. If we allow it to go to 3, it's now going to cost minus 5 going from 4 to 3 plus 10 going from 3 to 5. So it's going to cost in total 5. So that is how we're going to modify the fourth row here. We're going to have infinity, 2, because of how we compute uh, d4, 2, minus 5 still, 0 still, and finally 5. So that is your d3. 2, minus 5, 0, 5. Now, we're not done yet. Um, so um, you have to continually do this process until you worked out d5 because when you get to d5 that means you worked out all the possible path because you have taken into consideration every single vertex in the graph so again just like matrix multiplication um, that's a lot of work here um, and you have to be really careful when you're doing it so if i do ask you this kind of question in the exam um, i'll make sure it's a small ish maybe only four vertices because going from 4 to 5, there's actually a big jump in complexity. Um, so yeah, that's the Floyd Warshall algorithm. Hopefully you can see why it's brute force um, and why using dynamic programming here. Um, here's the code that you can try if you want. Uh, it's really simple, right? Um, the whole it's just like a triple array, uh, sorry, triple for loop here and. This is just the um, recursive relation that um, I showed earlier with the Ds. So that's really it. Um, that's just this. Anyway, so in terms of complexity, it's just a triple loop. So it's V cube. Compared to V cube log V if you're using magic multiplication, even with the improvement. The thing is, unlike magic multiplication, we don't have to find the minimum. Uh, like remember with, with magic multiplication um, when you process a row and a column you end up with five values well not five values you get, end up with some values and you gotta work out which one's the minimum here we don't we just keep on adding 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 so um, there's one less operation there in a sense um, so yeah so it's just v cube instead of v to the four but we can't use the um, the um, log feed trick that we did in um, uh, in magic multiplication. So, in terms of correctness, uh, again, both are just brute force using dynamic programming. So that's why it's um, that's why it's correct in a way because it tries every single combination. And just make sure you understand the difference between magic multiplication and Floyd Warshall. The problem decomposition is different with magic multiplication. You start with using zero edges and then you try one edge two edges three edges and more and more whereas flight washall is kind of strange as thought um, you look at all the paths going through one in somewhere in the middle uh, and then path going through two going to three going to four and so on where one two three four are just the numbering on the vertices all right so that's the end of graph algorithms we went through quite a bit um, and we're going to have some exercise during the workshop uh, but please make sure you try this on your own as well but most importantly make sure you understand how the algorithm works because I may ask you to do um, I may ask you to apply the algorithm like as, as in I give you a graph and go hey go go do flight washer or go do um, metric multiplication but I will definitely ask you some question to test if you understand how the algorithm works so uh, yeah, don't just know how to do it, also know how it works. All right, so I'll see you in the next lecture.